Do the webcam preferences. Yeah, it's doing your local one. I waved. That one? Yep. Look, there you are. Uh, entertaining or your money back? Now what? Share your screen. Yeah. Can't. Are you not? Are you, you a change presenter? I'm going to be with the right presenter. Show my screen. There you go. How am I showing? Not the right one. Huh? There we go. What do you think? We can see it. Perfect. <laughs> you can see it. Yes. Okay. Five minutes late. Eh. I was giving up, so I gave a talk on, uh, it might be uh, Friday. I came in, I got home. Do you know time? One o'clock in the morning, Friday morning? And then I gave a talk Friday afternoon. Guess what the topic was? Super exciting. Third party information oh. security risk management on a Friday afternoon. The Cloud Security Alliance. Mm -hmm. Minnesota. Uh, and then, uh, but then I showed up like 15 minutes late. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't get in trouble. Though. I don't think. I think it went really well. It's a lot of really good people. How are you guys doing? Excited? And they're all back after encryption. 160. What did you guys think slides. about encryption? 160? What time did you end up getting done? 845, 840. Right? I felt bad for you going home that night. Yeah. I know. My wife was like, so does that mean you're going to shave? I was like, no. Like, Why not? I'm like, because it's so easy to not shave. <clears throat> I enjoy not shaving. My wife likes it now too, so she's used to it. She I'm, didn't put I'm too impressed. Much. Impressed. Three one. Yes, a little work. Yeah. Can uh, I think it's hard for women to grow this, right? <laughs> Is it hard for women to grow this? It's probably some kind of. I hope so. <laughs> it's probably kind of vitamin or something you can take. My wife told me a joke about it. I can't remember what it was. I can't. Whatever. All right, let's get going. Uh, yeah. So keep it up. I do think you're kind of over the hump now, right? Uh, there's still a lot to cover, um, but you're sort of in a routine now. The driest of the dry stuff is kind of over. Tonight's kind of, uh, if you're a technical person, tonight is review is easy part. for a lot of people. If, it's, uh, if you're not a technical person, there'll be a lot of memorization. We all had to start somewhere, right? Even the, you know, the technical people had to start with memorizing the OSI model. Right, it just, it just have to do it. So you're either in one of those two camps. So some of the, some of you will be like, okay, it's good review, I got it. Others will be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's okay. Just keep, keep trudging along. Like I said, when I when we first started the class, I read the book three times. It's a thick one, mm -hmm. uh, and this was back in 2004. Uh, read it the first time. I didn't try to memorize anything. I just read it cover to cover. And then the second time I started to put the concepts together. And the third time I started to kind of master what these things actually meant. And then it sunk in. So you might have to do something like that. It's okay. Uh, we've completed chapters one through four so far. Uh, and I do think the hardest part is probably behind the driest part, like nothing beats security models. We did that, you know, a couple weeks ago. So thank God. You won't have to do that again, except, well, you will, because you have to memorize it, but I won't have to do it again. Until next year. Until next year. <laughs> uh, so everybody's good, healthy? You guys feeling overwhelmed? What do you What do you feel like right now? Too much information, right? No? Feeling all right? Things are good. Questions? I'm sort of disappointed at what Slack's looking like. It's like, do you guys all know how Slack works and stuff? Do you need any help? So I was expecting more questions like, hey, I'm looking at this, I found this, you know, mm -hmm. resource, whatever. I posted a few things. I wrote a couple of articles this weekend. One was, uh, it's, it's funny, people don't like to be called arrogant. 
Yeah, weird. <laughs> My mom called me arrogant. That's where this whole thing started. Uh, but I, you know, whatever. And I, I a question. I'm not going to blame people. I'm not going to call people out for being arrogant because I think I'm just as arrogant as the next person. And then I wrote another one about. Oh, I'm looking for data. Do you guys see that post? I need data. So writing the second. Um, it's information security for normal people, and I refer to anybody who's not a security person as being normal. That's an affectionate term. It's not a derogatory word. Uh, and so I was writing this. I'm writing, and one of the I was writing in the book was I was complaining about how us as security people, this is the arrogance tie in too, how we we think we know what the normal people think, right? You know, yet you know, we draw a bunch of conclusions based on false assumptions and the things that I, I know that the things that we write don't resonate very well with them even when we write to them right so i was kind of complaining about this in this part of the book and then i was like holy crap i'm guilty of this because i'm doing that right now in this book so i stopped and i created a survey for normal people to take to 30 questions just Tell us what you think about security. Tell us what you think is good, what you think is bad. Give us some advice on how we can do better. Um, and it, the, so far, the results have been eye-opening. We have about 500 responses so far. That gives us a, a margin of error of about 4%. So that's you know a really good sample yeah. uh, so far. But I need more. You know, the more data, the better. So if you go to my website, you'll see uh, you know evanfrancine.com. You'll see the link there to take uh, to take the survey, and then send it. If you feel comfortable, send it to your friends and family. You know, it's an opportunity for us to learn what they have to say about security. Uh, also, that's about it. I was in a uh, Range Rover. It was pretty sweet. I drive a F two fifty, like it's a big truck, but it's like the base truck, right? It's, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles in it. Everything like that. So when you get into a, a Range Rover, it's fancy. Like, Whoa, not my thing. That was fun. You guys all read chapters one through four? You guys keeping up on the reading so far? Yeah, good. Any questions? Anything I can answer? We went through encryption last week. Anything that didn't click? Any? Nothing online? Nothing yet. We got this class Wednesday, Monday, and then another break. So we got three classes and another break. So yep, your a chance to catch your up. chance to catch up. And one of the things that I told before is if you want to get a study group up, just email us. Uh, now I'm saying let's put it all on Slack, right? Let's start organizing on Slack. I'd like to see a lot more activity because uh, it's just a great place where we can collaborate and share questions. And I, if anybody, uh, so if you ask a question and you're like maybe it's a dumb question or not, don't worry about it. You know, just ask a question because Brad and I and uh, Brandon, you know, we'll filter out the jerks if there are any, you know, give people crap. So, about <coughs> I don't think there are any, but it could be. Yeah, you won't need this for the test, but it's, I think it's a good question. Why use prime factors instead of ellipt elliptical curve for encryption? Why, why prime factors instead it's of elliptical fast curve? Fast and low, easy to I do. Think it's, I think, well, I think it's more difficult to write, write it. I don't know. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. So elliptical curve requires less computing resources. Uh, it is stronger per, per bit of key. So yeah. I don't know why they wouldn't, they wouldn't use it more often. Research. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. You won't need that for the exam. It is a good question. This, yeah, one that I didn't think of. All right, so 160 slides last time, 134 slides tonight. Tonight we can go pretty fast, too, because a lot of this is just going to be memorization. Here's the reminder. The Slack channel is up there for everybody. Uh, if you didn't invite, email us. And make sure you get the invite so that you can, you know, collaborate there. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, I'll just keep posting a bunch of stupid stuff up there. All right. Quiz. What type of sprinkler system would be best for an art gallery? Wet pipe, dry pipe, deluge, or pre-action? So deluge. Uh, okay. I'll, pre, pre yeah, pre yeah, pre-action would be the right one. And the reason why is it gives me time, it buys me time to deactivate the uh, the sprinkler system before the art gets ruined. 
uh, because there's got to be two actions. Typically, one action would fill the pipe. So you hear, you, and if you've ever heard it before, it, it's like a because it's pushing all the gas out and throwing up water, and then the second action would be to actually release the valve to let the water out. Deluge is, uh, I don't know where we see that, but it's, it's just a you know flood of water. The, the sprinkler head is like twice the size as, as a normal one. These are just normal. Do you see the bulbs on these? What color are these, red? I think they're red. I think that's, what's the temp, like 165, something like that? That's when that melts and then releases. The most common, uh, I think in, in server rooms today, the most common um, sprinkler system today is wet pipe, believe it or not. It's cheap. I don't, it's just what it is. So what's the primary drawback of using dogs as a perimeter control? Training, cost, liability, appearance. Liability. Unless you have an ugly dog. If you have an ugly dog, it's definitely going to be D. <laughs> I have a pretty dog. I have three dogs. So you say what? Liability? Yeah. Your insurance is going to go up significantly, I think, uh, if you have a dog. The RSA algorithm is based on which one-way function? Elliptic curves, discrete algorithm, frequency distribution, factoring composite numbers into their primes. Which one? D. D? Do you all agree? Uh, yeah, so elliptic, so it would have had to have been A or D. C isn't, uh, it's not a, it's not a um, public key cryptography. That's my word. That, that is a word. Look it up. Uh, algorithm and elliptic curve is, RSA is not an elliptic curve. So yeah, that's it. You're surfing the web via a wireless network. You know, 50% of security people claim that they don't use public Wi-Fi. Do you know that? Yeah. Well, because we. Uh, oh, we talked about it. I can't remember. That's the only talked, reason. I can't remember who I talked to anymore. Uh, 50%. You guys all use public Wi-Fi? It's okay if you do. I do. I absolutely have to. I do. A VPN. Yeah. There's lots of free VPN solutions, you know, to still use public Wi-Fi. Turn off uh, auto join, you know, wireless networks, for sure, uh, because it's real easy to get you to connect to my AP versus, you know, the authorized one. But anyway, you're surfing the web via wireless network. Your wireless connection becomes unreliable, so you plug into a wired network to configure surf, continue surfing while you Change physical network should be required no change. What security feature allows this? Abstraction, where segmentation, layering, a process isolation. Which one? Layering. C. C, yep. And a criminal deduces. Do criminals deduce? Hmm. Interesting. That an organization is holding an off site meeting. And has few people in the building based on the low traffic volume to and from the parking lot and uses the opportunity to break into the building to set up. So what type of an attack has been launched? Aggregation, emanations, inference, maintenance hook. Inference. Correct. What is the most important goal of fire suppression systems? Oh, I don't even have to read the answers because you see it, right? There's B. We've been driving that one home. All right, communication and network security design and protecting. This is chapter five. We're on page, what page is this? Two something? I don't know. How many? Is it 214 or 212? Something like 219. that. 219. 219. 219. Uh, yeah, so this is, you know, like I said, this is for technical people. This won't be a problem. It'll be a lot of remediation. And even today, so we get a little bit more weird on uh, Wednesday. So we start talking about frame relay and things at ISDN. Some things that, unless you've been in this business for a long time, you don't, you've probably never seen it before. Uh, but we're just going through the basics, like uh, like the OSI model with TCP IP. Uh, I'm, I geek out more about this stuff because I, I grew up a networking guy, you know, a Cisco guy. So um, this stuff is really cool to me. So we'll go through network architecture and design, uh, secure network devices and protocols and secure communications. 
Uh, yeah, so we're going to go through 219. Thank you. Should have read the slides that I created. Uh, all right, defense in depth. So I, I, there's a methodology there, the adversary obstruction uh, requirements. It's not testable, but it's a it's a pretty good document from the NSA. Uh, and there's a link there. Uh, if you really want to know how to do this, I think right, uh, it's it'd be really difficult to implement that in the most commercial environments because it is you'd have to design it sort of that way from the get go. Uh, but a defense in depth, I, I use the analogy of a crunchy shell GUI center. That's how most people build their information security programs. That's how most people build their network defense. They focus so much on the perimeter that once somebody's already inside the perimeter, it's free reign, right? It's pivot, 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 and that's what attackers do until they find the, the golden egg, nugget, something. Yeah. And then they exfiltrate data because people also don't do a very good job of egress filtering. Focus so much on ingress filtering, keeping the bad guys out that we typically lack the ingress, what happened, what can get out, right? So there's a couple of things here. There's ingress in, egress out, and then there's uh, layers of um, hopefully uh, protection inside the network. So this is where things like network isolation, I use, I use the term network isolation versus network segmentation because most people think VLANs, right? Layer three, which we'll get into layer three, what that is, but most people think like layer three Segmentation is defense in depth, you know, because you'll ask, well, is the network segmented? Oh, yeah, it's segmented. But there's no restriction in the traffic between network segments, right? Uh, now, true network segmentation and isolate would be isolation. And this became a central point, actually, in the target breach when, uh, uh, when I was working on the special litigation committee. Uh, because in, in, in a, going back to PCI requirements, remember PCI? We talked about PCI. PCI DSS, the data security standard, only applies to the cardholder data environment. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the CDE. Now, the cardholder data environment is a segmented, isolated container in the network where I keep all the network, all the uh, the payment card information, right? And the point of why I would do that was so if this is the CDE versus this being the CDE, I only have to worry about compliance for this, not that, right? It costs you a lot less. So central to, you know, like the target breach was from the corporate network into the store networks, they had segmentation and PCI compliant, uh, but port 3389 was open between the, the, the corporate environment and the store environment. Now, 3389, if you don't know what that is, that's RDP, that's Remote Desktop Protocol. That's basically just, uh, it's a full session. It's an interactive session on another system remotely. So if that's, if that's open, that's hardly isolated, right? So then P, uh, PCI had to change sort of their guidance on isolation versus segmentation. And now the rule of thumb is, is that if there's anything outside of the cardholder data environment, complete com you know, consider complete compromise. Is there any way that that could affect the security of cardholder data? That makes sense. So like if you take, in this case, the video server, which was in the target breach, the video server had RDP access into the store networks. So if there's a complete compromise of the video server, was could it affect the security of cardholder data? Absolutely, because 3389 was open, so it was a perfect pivot, which is what was happened, which is what happened in that breach. Uh, that's not isolation, right? And that defense in depth essentially turned out to be small layers because there is no defense in depth there. In that, so it makes sense. All right. So defense in depth is a big thing. Very, very rarely do we see it done well. To be, to be truthful. Um, but it's a great, because nowadays you can just assume that an attacker has gotten into the environment. Right? A phishing attack, a simple compromise of the human element of security, it's fairly easy to get into most environments. So then what would you have? And it's, and the purpose too isn't to just, isn't to completely, uh, because you can't ever really count on being certain that you've contained an attacker in your network but what you want, you want it to make it difficult, enough, enough difficulty for them that they will raise some suspicions, some alarms. You'll see some anomalies and maybe 
the network traffic. You'll see something come up on on uh, in your logging, right? Because they have to keep trying so many different things. That's the point. So anyway, that's just the cover page for the NSA methodology for adversary obstruction. It's a good document. Uh, if you actually dig into it, so the document itself is very simple, but the references to what it to what it references, uh, it, it's hard. I mean, I documented, wrote out the requirements based on, <laughs> you know, for the project I'm working on right now. It's like, yeah, there's no way you're putting that in. Uh, just to know, you know, sort of, I guess, diagram to drive home the point about network defense in depth. What you see on the right hand side is some security layers, some additional technologies that you could put in place in the environment. I would caution there are ways to do defense in depth without adding complexity or too much unnecessary complexity into the environment. And I say that because what we see people also do is continue to buy more and more technologies, right? Time to protect things. And then what happens is my my technology stack is so complicated that nobody really knows what we're covering what we're not. So complexity is the enemy of security. That's the trick. Any questions on that? Okay. Simplex, duplex, half duplex. So simplex is just a one-way communication. It'd just be like uh, when I'm in trouble, it'd be my wife talking to me. You know, just one way. And you might... I'm usually receiving it, uh, but it's a car radio. <laughs> usually, so, you know, you gotta have the, you gotta have the flow control turned on, mm -hmm. and I also need uh, you know, there's gotta be some checksums. There's gotta be some other things in the traffic. I'm gonna receive what you're saying. Uh, but simplex is one way. Half duplex is two way, but one way at a time. Uh, and then full duplex is back and forth uh, simultaneously. Most network traffic. So the way you used to have to do uh, this is you'd have, uh, we had what was auto negotiate on a lot of your network devices. They would auto negotiate what duplex they were running. Uh, a lot of times they'd get it wrong, so you'd have to manually set it. But uh, understanding for the test, simplex one way, nothing back. Uh, half duplex one way, back. It's like uh, CB, uh, CB radio. Do they still have those? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then full duplex would be just like a normal conversation you and I are having. So that's just basics, more basics, baseband and broadband. Baseband has one signal, uh, one channel, that's it. Uh, it can carry, so now you can digitize. Uh, so don't confuse one channel with meaning that it can only carry one type of data. Because sometimes people get confused. Well, if I can get, you know, I might have DSL at home and I can get phone, I can get, or I get voice, I get uh, uh, television, I get, uh, you know, I mean, I can get them all kind of through that. It's all been digitized. That's So it's still one channel, whereas uh, broadband, it's multiple channels brought into, into one. So broadband, like uh, uh, at home, your cable is a broadband connection. Uh, mm, that's not true anymore. That's baseband, too. Uh, but anyway, baseband, broadband, you understand baseband, one channel, broadband, multiple channels. Then we got analog and digital. Digital is easy. It's discrete. It's on or off. Um, that's it. That's why securing computers, if you didn't have the human element, would be really easy because it's on or off. Computers only do what you tell them to do. That's it. But then you bring this analog piece into it because people are analog. They're all over the place. Sometimes they're in a good mood. Sometimes they're in a bad mood. Sometimes, you know, you just never know where they're at. They're on a wavelength. They're not discrete. Uh, analog signals would be uh, like voice waves, what's going through the air right now. That's all analog. Uh, digital is just ones and zeros. It's binary. Make sense? Lands, wans, mans, gans, and pants. Okay? Enough said. No, I'm just kidding. PANS personal area networks, typically 100 feet or less. <coughs> Bluetooth network would be a, a, night, uh, a personal area network. Typically, it's two points. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. doesn't have to be, though. 100 meters or less, I guess. Uh, local area network is like what we have here. It's usually one geographic location. 
It could be multiple subnets because you have lands and then you have VLANs, virtual lands. So I can segment the LAN into multiple smaller LANs. I would do that for network management potentially. Uh, but a LAN is a local area network, a metropolitan area network. If we had a location here and maybe a location in Rosemount, we would have a connection between us, and that would be considered a, multi, uh, a metropolitan area network. Um, it could also be a campus, an office park. Those things are all metropolitan area networks. A wide area network is over a larger geographic expanse. So maybe here in St. Louis or here in even L.A., you know, we would have a wide area connection. There are different technologies that are used in each one of these, too. Not so much man and land, maybe. Just crossover. And then GAN is a global area network. So that'd be like here in France, right? Pretty self-explanatory if you know what the first letter stands for. They're all area networks. Circuit switch networks. We have circuit switch networks, and then we have packet switch networks. So circuit switch networks would be like a telephone call. A circuit switch, the circuit is built, and all network traffic goes across that circuit. Uh, when, the, when the connection is done, the circuit is terminated and torn back down. Now, there's some waste. There's a little bit more waste in a, in a circuit switch network. Um, it's a little bit maybe more predictable than a packet switch network, um, but that's, that's how they work. Most networks today that we're using uh, or packet switch networks. You know, the internet is a packet switch network, which is this one. Instead of dedicated circuit being brought up and torn down, uh, this is each packet. So a packet would be a piece of data, depending on what protocols you're using and all those other things. Two might take different routes, right? It'll take, depending on routing protocols you're using and whatever else, but it could take into account the bandwidth of a specific link in you know, the hops or the number of links between two locations you could take into account, you know, uh, other performance metrics, congestion, things like that. You can do that on a packet switch network because a circuit isn't brought up and then all network traffic doesn't happen and then torn down. This is each packet goes may go a different way. They may all go the same too. You just sort of don't know. Well, you could know, but you don't. Make sense? Circuit switched and packet switched. This is just an example of a packet switch network. So the internet is a packet switch network. A circuit switch network would be like a, a frame relay. It would be like a circuit switch network. And we'll talk about that next Sunday, when, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday. Talk about PVCs and SVCs, permanent virtual circuits and switch virtual circuits. Those are frame relay stuff. Uh, but so that's an example of a switch of a, and the telephone network is another circuit switch network. The internet is, like I said, the packet switched. Good stuff. Layered design. All right. So we've got two models, and we have to memorize these. So memorize the OSI model, and we have to memorize the TCP/IP model. They map together. There's four layers in the TCP/IP model, and there's seven layers in the OSI model. These are conceptual models. Uh, TCP/IP is more of a, it has a protocol stack sort of mapped to it, so it's much more practical than the OSI model. The OSI model is really conceptual. Uh, yeah, starting at layer seven, the top, that's the application layer, going all the way down to physical. The functions get a lot less complicated, a lot simpler as you go down the protocol stack or the, I guess, OSI layers. Uh, so the difference between models and stacks, a stack would have actual protocols that are mapped to layers. So it's a stack, it's a, it's a conglomeration or a group of protocols that would function. Uh, yeah, protocols are rules. That's, you know, protocol and rule are the same word. So OSI, OSI model, the open system interconnect, this is, uh, it's been around forever, I think. The it is abstract. Is this, who's this? Yours. Thank you. <laughs> you guys want to get some to drink? All right. How many of you guys know the OSI model? It's just you. Oh, and you? Two of you. You okay? It's going to say. <laughs> I raised it the first time. Yeah, that's okay. So, um, I learned it the hard way. I didn't. What are those things we call the word mnemonics? Mnemonic. Yep. I never got those. I always. I do everything the hard way. Anyway. Uh, 
So there's seven layers, application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, physical. You'll have to memorize that. And then you go back up the other way. So the way things work is, and it's called encapsulation. We'll get into that too. So as something goes down the protocol stack, it just keeps adding, you know, header. So usually uh, well, layer three is where it would start. No, layer four It's where we would start adding things to your data, right? So your data comes through. We add a header, maybe a foot, maybe a trailer or a footer, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then it would just continue to go down the protocol stack until it gets to the physical layer where it's a bunch of electrical impulses, flashes of light, depending on what media you're using. And the media you're using would be really decided on layer two because layer two has to prepare it for layer one. Does that make sense? So it kind of goes down. And then when it comes off the wire at the other side, it just goes back up. Right, and it strips away, strips away, strips away. Because in the header is what what do you need to talk to above it? Right? Where do I hand this off to? And you'll see that when we talk about TCP IP and we talk about TCP ports and UDP ports. So at the network layer, we read the header and it's like, oh, this goes to TCP port 80, right? So hand it up and then that would then hand it up again till we get to the web browser and make sense? So down and then back up again. It'll make sense, don't worry. Yeah, absolutely. So used uh, reference point, so layer one is universally understood. Yeah, so that, that was the reason why the OSI, because back then, uh, you know, two network devices wouldn't be able to communicate with each other because they're conceptually not, they don't function the same way. So that's why the OSI was to get everybody creating systems that would be able to communicate together from different manufacturers. So that's where the OSI. Formula called X.200, if you want to read it, um, I don't suggest it, but you could. You're not going to get tested on that. You will get tested on this. So I, there's a lot of references in here. So if you um, if you have the slides and you use the slides as uh, study material, you, you'll be totally fine. So application, so you can see on the left side the data unit. We call, sometimes we call that a PDU, a protocol data unit or just a data unit, so it's data, 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 and then it starts getting broken down into segments, and then packets, and then frames, and then bits. Bits are ones and zeros, right? One and zero, so like I said, a flash of light, it's on or it's off. Uh, an electrical impulse, it's, the electricity is on or it's off. Um, yeah, so application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, physical, we're gonna go through each one of these. Reduces complexity, standardizes interfaces, allows you know a developer. So if I'm a developer of an application, I don't have to write everything into my application to get it all the way to the ones and zeros, right? Uh, I can write it to maybe the device driver, uh, or maybe even something built into the operating system itself that would hand it and take it off. So yeah, makes it a lot easier. These are some mnemonics if you like. Like I said, I never i never memorize these, but people don't want to see Paula Abdul. So that'd be physical, data link, network, transport. Uh, see, I never go that way. Session, presentation, application. People don't need those stupid packets anyway. I kind of like that one. People do not teach students pointless acronyms. I'm not teaching it. I'm just teaching it. Uh, please do not take salespeople's advice. See, that's all pretty good stuff. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I like the last one. Any of you guys in sales? Okay. You I don't count, right? No, no, no. No, no, no. You're an architect? Yes. Yeah. All right, so layer one, starting at the bottom. Layer one, the most, the simplest layer, uh, ones and zeros. Uh, Whatever type of energy you're using, radio waves, um, like I said, flashes of light, fiber optic, uh, electrical signals, it's copper, whatever it happens to be. Cabling standards live here. We're going to learn about thin net, thick net, unshielded twisted pair. There used to be shielded twisted pair. No one ever uses shielded twisted pair anymore. You guys ever seen shielded twisted you know, pair? That's where it's got an extra so layer of sheeting. It's very, very rigid. Uh, and I'll show you some cool things about thin net and thick net. I don't know if you remember that, you know, the original Ethernet standards where uh, you had wiretaps, vampire taps. You had to kind of 
cramp them down in there. Uh, layer one devices also include hubs and repeaters. Now that's going to be really important because you will get probably on the test what types of devices operate at layer mm -hmm. one. So what a hub, and we'll get into this again, so I'll, we'll come back to this. I think probably in Wednesday, what a repeater is, is it's two ports and it just regenerates the signal. It takes it in this port and regenerates it out this port. That's it. There's no filtering, there's no logic. It's just regenerate the signal. Because one of the things that happens over the long haul of a, of a network cable is called attenuation. The, uh, the signal starts to deteriorate. The farther it goes, the, the, the weaker it gets. So you put a repeater in place to regenerate that signal and extend the length of my, my segment. Uh, a hub is just a multi-port repeater. So a repeater, two ports, a hub. Maybe you know, 16, 20, 30, I don't know how many parts you want out of a hub. Uh, I don't even sell hubs anymore. Mm -hmm. Do they really? Yeah, the only time I'd ever use a hub now is if I wanted to uh, eavesdrop into the network traffic because there's no logic there, so I'd get everything forwarded to me on that network. Yeah, that's it, probably not for business, but yeah, personal. Yeah, we don't like hubs. From a security no. standpoint, we don't like hubs because we have no control. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect to see a hub for a corporate use. Mm -hmm. Not unless I was using it for something like that. Like a lot of times we would put yeah. a, an IPS or a back end to be an IDS, plug that into a hub, you know, so that we could see all the network traffic on that. But like, now you just put things in Prometheus. Yeah, now well now you know there's yeah. uh, there's usually a tap somewhere yeah. on, a, on a switch or something. Uh, so, I can... so everyone knows Shield is uh, still used with AV equipment. Oh, all right. So there you go. There you go. So it makes sense. Compare. And I don't think you'll see it on the test, but that's really good information. I haven't, I yeah. don't even know. All right, so binary. That's how I say it in uh, the UK. So if you're, that's, that's on the test. No? That's how you I drove it. Yeah, I, I heard. Okay. <laughs> this is the voice of God coming over hmm. during the middle of encryption. Yeah. <laughs> My buddy just bought his, his new Harley and to come over and show it to me. And then, he let me and then he let me no he let he let it oh, nice. around and, and I got on it before my wife came out. So oh, I was gonna say because you're not allowed. So I, I'm out. <laughs> she's like hey and then I came back and she says uh I don't think you're around that I was like it's just you know around the corner. So I got in trouble. I don't know how I got on that. Binary. All right we've beaten that one up pretty good. Uh so layer two there's two Actual sub layers in layer two, there's the uh, media access control and the logical layer. The logical link layer is above the media access control layer. And the way I always remember this is the media access control, we're gonna get into what's called a MAC address pretty soon, which is a hardware address that's burned into network devices. You can override it with software, but for the purpose of the test, it's hard coded, it's burned into the network uh, device that's communicating. Because computers actually op, com, communicate with each other or physical addresses. Uh, there's a logical address, which is the IP address, which gets resolved to the physical address. And then even above that, like we're used to, you know, like www.frsecure.com, right? DNS resolves that. That's a host name that humans speak really easily. That gets resolved to an IP address. And then the IP address, and you'll see a bunch of hops, so whatever. The IP address has to be resolved to a MAC address. Um, MAC address, same thing. Media access control it happens at layer two. Logical link, logical link control. So media access control interfaces with layer one. Logical link control interfaces with layer three. Um, it would be taking that logical address, that IP address, in a TCP/IP protocol and resolving it. But uh, those are the two layers of the logical link control. Things that also happen here at Data Link would be um, what type of network topology I'd be using. Is this Ethernet? Is this frame relay? Is this, God forbid, token ring? Uh, FIDI, fiber device, fiber, fiber digital device interface, whatever. What kind of topology are we communicating on? That would happen at layer two also. So reliable transfer of data across the media because it has to translate it for the media. There might be some checksums there. Depends on what you built into your protocol stack. Physical addressing. So physical addressing, that's media, when you're physical addressing, that's the media access control, that's the MAC address. 
um, network topology, error, application, and flow control. All that stuff happens in layer two. So there's a little more logic here. Right? A physical layer, we didn't have any logic. It was just regeneration of signals. If that layer two has some, some logic. We don't go into some of the things. Oh, switches and bridges. Okay. So uh, like I told you, a repeater regenerates the signal. A bridge also regenerates the sig signal, but it does bring based on layer two addresses, MAC addresses. Right? So it builds a table of, so this is where logic comes in. Uh, a bridge would say, would start building a table like out this port over here are all these MAC addresses. Out this port over here are all these MAC addresses. So if the bridge received a net, uh, network traffic for the same port it came in on, right, it, it knows that that MAC address is over here, it wouldn't forward it out the other port. Does that make sense? And vice versa. It would build, you know, you build a table or you could manually configure it. Now, a switch is just a multi port bridge. Works the same way. It's just multiple ports. So a bridge, two ports, uh, but it uses those MAC addresses, that media access control address, uh, to make those forwarding decisions. And we'll get into that again. Uh, but you know, the second time it'll probably you know resonate more. All right, layer three. Uh, so routing happens at layer three. Now we're even adding more logic into. Um, you know, the decisions for network traffic. Uh, this is where logical addresses happen. Uh, we also have a bunch more sort of flow control stuff with helper protocols and things like that. <coughs> uh, but routing would be at layer three. Uh, so at layer three, it would be logical addresses have to route to MAC addresses. I could have one group of logical addresses over here and one group of logical addresses over here could be a VLAN, a virtual local area network, or it could be a router in between the two. Uh, in order for me to go from one of those to the other, I'd have to go through a router, it'd have to be routed. That happens at layer three. So whenever you hear route, routed, that's layer three. Switches, layer two, hubs, repeaters, layer one, that'll be all testable. That's layer Nope, nope. That, does not not exist. Going there. <laughs> that does not exist in the terms of the exam. No, and it, yeah, it shouldn't I mean, exist at all, period, because it drives everybody right. crazy, like, what the hell? But, it used to be so simple. Right. Like a, like a, a switch, switched. Yep. A router, routed. That was it. Now there's, you know, it was. It happened, my first time kind of running into that was the 6500s. 60, you guys ever seen the 6500s, oh, yeah. like 6509 or 6530? Mm -hmm. And it was like, now I can firewall. You know, I can do a firewall blade in this thing. It's like, just confused everything for me. I like the old 5000, the Cat 5000s, where the switch just switched. That's all it did. Yeah. Use playing emulation. Play yeah. Can you still buy Cat 5000? Yeah, I'm sure you can buy one, one, but I'm trying to really secure. I'm telling you, man, it worked. It was, those things were rock solid. Uh, catalyst. So Catalyst yeah. stands for Catalyst. It was an old system switch. I learned uh, CCMP on a Catalyst 5000 and some 2501s uh, routers. Nice. Yeah. That's all you needed for your lab then. Yeah. yeah. 189 bucks on <laughs> Catalyst 5000 24 port. Just, that was the only one left. That's not the picture of it though. No. Those were like for you. The things, that thing that were shown there. You had a nine slot. Um, yeah, right, but the smallest one's four. Uh, this, one's, this one's a 1U. Looks like that's like that's a blade. blade. Well, then they didn't make a Cat 5000 1U, did they? I don't know. Anyway, layer three networking, uh, routing, all that stuff happens there. Provides connectivity and path selection. So when you talk about routing, so uh, when we talk about routing protocols, specifically when we get into TCP IP, because we don't have to worry about other protocols anymore. There used to be, you had to memorize IPX, SPX, you had to memorize Apple Talk, you had to memorize, I mean, now it's just TCP IP. So it's good that one, you know, emerged. So when you talk about routing in a TCP IP network, depending on the router, routing protocol, there's going to be a number of hops and other number of other routers that you have to go through. So when we talk about route selection at the network layer, those d decisions are sort of made. How am I going to get from point A to point B, even though I have to go through 10 different other points along the network? 
if those decisions were going to be made, they'd be made at the network layer. So question online, is layer three where VLANs prevent protocols from crossing between ports? Uh, something that keeps IPX or older from crossing networks? Yeah. 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 Well. Yeah. Got a yeah. Crossing it's, ports. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, when they're set up on different VLANs, that part helps. Yeah, because you Cause that's IPX, what SPX, IPX, SPX, and TCP/IP would not communicate with each other without a route and a translation. So that's where you would. Yeah, you know, you'd have to layer. They wouldn't. I don't think they would ask that. But no, it's good to know. If you are IPX, SPX, let me know. I'd like to come see it. It's been a while since I've seen a Nobel Network network right yeah. that old. Uh, layer four, transport layer. So again, we're adding more function, more functionality, logic into, you know, traffic discussions. Here we've got packet sequencing. So sequencing would be uh, you know, putting packets back together again. Uh, so remember we have a packet, if we're running on a packet switch network, five packets went this way, three went this way, two went this way, they'll arrive at the destination at different times. So somehow we've got to be able to put those packets back together again. Layer four, transport layer would, would handle that for us. Flow control is also, you know, sometimes, you know, the receiving uh, host can't ex can't receive traffic as fast as you can send it or, you know, vice versa. So there'll have to be some flow control negotiation potentially happening. Error detection, if packets got corrupted, packets didn't show up. All those things would happen at layer four. TCP and UDP are layer four protocols, but they're not layer four protocols in the OSI model. Those are protocols in the TCP IP model. Okay. but that's where they map. So um, I don't want. I don't want you just thinking the TCP and UDP are layer four OSI protocols because the OSI doesn't have specific protocols. Uh, <clears throat> resending or resequencing of packets all happens at layer four. So there's our things to uh, remember. So another thing that you'll sometimes hear on transport layers end to end communication. Whereas in the session layer, you hear, you'll hear host-to-host -host communication. Sometimes you'll hear those things. So I don't think they'll get that granular on test, but uh, sometimes people you know, use those terms. Concerned with transportation issues between hosts, data uh, transport reliability, establish, maintain, terminate virtual circuits. So it, it, don't get this confused either with a, a circuit-switched network. This is a virtual circuit, right? So amongst all these pa these hops and everything that where the packets have to go, there's a virtual circuit, you know, that we're sort of maintaining. Like I'm expecting these packets, you're sending these packets. There's this communication that we're having together. Uh, that's the virtual circuit in this context. Fault detection, recovery information, flow control, all those things are transport layer stuff. Now we've got session layer, message, message it manages sessions. Uh, this is just another layer up. So before we had, uh, this is where host to host communication takes place. Providing maintenance of connections, remote procedure calls. You don't have to worry too much about remote procedure calls yet. We will get to this again. When we talk about uh, CORBA, which is uh, DCOM, stuff like that, but RPCs. Just remote procedures calls, so I'm calling a specific service on another system, those types of things. Uh, a good way to remember the session layers function is connections between applications. This is where duplex is defined. That's that. I think session layer is one of those neglected ones. I just don't dig into session layer stuff very much because everything we do today is pretty much TCP IP. Right? And so we condense session and transport or condense it up into the application layer. Depends. It's a bridge one. Uh, presentation layer. So presentation, this is preparing the data for presentation. Right. So we're starting to really pull away all the networky stuff and put in the application-y stuff. So a lot of translation happens here. Uh, encryption, decryption sometimes functions here. Uh, if it's at that layer, there's also encryption that can be built throughout, but traditionally encryption and decryption would have compression and decompression would happen here. Uh, you can see some of the protocols that might be used are the not protocols, they're uh, standards that might be used here. So ASCII, GIF, JPEG, TIFF, 
you hear any of those, you're talking presentation layer. Just getting ready to sort of finally hand it off to the application. This is usually written into the application too. <coughs> so formats of data, data structures, all that kind of stuff happens at layer six. And then finally, layer seven. Now you see protocols there, Telnet and FTP. Those are also TCP IP protocols. There are no protocols in the OSI model specifically, right? So this is just as reference. But when we talk about, you know, the map between the DOD model or the TCP IP model and um, the OSI, those would be TCP IP protocols. So where you interface with your computer application, these are the things that you see and interact with as a user, the web browser, word processor, instant messaging, all those things happen at layer seven. This is the final presentation, final out for you as the consumer. That's it. There's our, uh, what are those things called again? Mnemonics again? Mnemonics. These are a couple yeah. extra ones, aren't they? Please do not throw sausage pizza away. Don't throw any pizza away. Uh, please do not. You shouldn't. We were laughing at me. I wouldn't throw pizza away. You guys go to college? Pizza sitting out on the counter for <laughs> weeks. Still good. I was so stupid back then, I would cut off pieces of mold off the pizza. <laughs> uh, things we do. I actually still do that. But I have a wife now. It stops me. <laughs> He's tired of me getting sick. I have no food discernment. I'm really good at like security stuff, but food, I have no discernment. I'll just eat whatever's in front of me. It's just such a bad thing. Please do not tell salespeople anything. All people seem to need data processing. So the other way, so there's application presentation. Yeah, it's going so, to go Yeah, so that one, that one would be one that I, because I always learned top down. I didn't learn the other way. So I can do application presentation, session transport, network, data lane, physical. I have to think before I go back up the other way. But memorize it. Uh, I'm almost certain you'll see a test here. So, okay, now we're translating. This is a good graphic because you see the OSI model there. Their roles, so what kind of happens, and then some example protocols there. And then you'll see the DOD model on the far right. So you've got but sandwiched between the two models that you'll both, you need to know both of them. You've got the OSI model over here and you've got the DOD model, DOD, TCIP interchangeable model. So you've got, see how the, the process layer, sometimes called the application layer on the DOD, uh, maps to the top three layers of the OSI model, the host to host, the TCP uh, or transport layer, uh, TCP and UDP are the two protocols, you know, in that model. Uh, the internet is network layer, and then network in the DOD model is the bottom two, uh, data link and physical. But this is a good one to memorize because mm -hmm. you can also see different equipment there. So we've got hubs and repeaters down there, and the physical layer repeater is not there, but it's it's also supposed to be there. Switch, bridge, uh, PPP, SLIP, we'll talk about those two. So serial link internet protocol and point to point protocol. Point to point protocol is still used today. Serial link internet protocol is not. It's been replaced, deprecated. Routers, you can see a layer three, there's some protocols there. We've got IP, IPX, ICMP. ICMP is a, is a helper protocol for IP. IP is the big dog on, on, the, on the network layer. Uh, ICMP is the internet control message protocol. It kind of handles the messaging. Uh, source crunch happens, all kinds of stuff. Uh, there's another protocol there that's not referenced very often. It's the IGMP. It's the internet group messaging protocol. Uh, we would use that in, uh, uh, what do you call it? Not broadcast, uh, multicast, right? TCP, UDP are the big dogs at the transport layer. We're gonna get into that. IPX also plays there, or sorry, SPX plays there, but you don't have to worry about that. SPX is dead. IPX, SP, unless it's dead, forget it. Well, it is, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen it in years, all those. You know, it was such a crazy time back then. Novell uh, and Microsoft were the two big dogs. Novell was first to the file print world. And Microsoft wanted to get into it, and, and it was so cutthroat that Microsoft would send limousines over to Novell's headquarters to pick up Novell developers, take them back to Microsoft, and offer them this huge, you know, salaries. I mean, it was so cutthroat. They were going back 
That's and if you've cool. seen Novell file structure and trees and all that, I mean, if you look at AD, they're, it's, <laughs> gosh, yeah. awfully similar. Mm -hmm. Well, and at the time, for the longest time, all the way through NT, Novell had a much better directory because mm -hmm. NT didn't have a directory. And he was just file and print, but Novell had a directory well before Active Directory. Mm -hmm. It's crazy back then. All right, so the TCP IP model, transmission control internet protocol of the 1970s. One of the major, it was built with resiliency and uh, built into it. So it was built, uh, that's why you have all the error checking flow control, all that other stuff is because if the network were taken down, it was supposed to still function. It was, it was in times of war, the, net, the, the, the government could count on it. The problem is, is security was never built into it. Security was never built into TCP IP, so you'll never be able to really secure it. I mean, truly, uh, they, we add on, you know, VPN tunneling and all that other stuff with IPsec, SP, you know, IPsec, SPsec. I was thinking IPsec still. Uh, but it still won't be because something that's insecure at the core will always be insecure. So you always have the struggle with TCP IP version four. Version six has IPX, SPX built into it. It was built with security in, ingrained in it. But, you know, that's, that's just how TCP IP is. Uh, a suite of protocols, including UDP, so user data. There's a lot of protocols. I'll show you a, a graphic with a good number of protocols for TCP IP of the protocol stack. Um, when I say TCP IP, I'm referring to the model. Right? So if you hear me say TCP IP, I'm referring to the whole model, not just TCP and IP. Because um, within TCP IP, the, you know, the model, there's hundreds, thousands of different protocols. We'll cover the big ones today. Uh, so UDP, ICMP, we talked about that a little bit more. We'll talk more about it here in a little bit. Uh, link layer in place of the network access layer. TCP IP doesn't really do much once it hands it off to layer mm -hmm. two. Layer one, there's nothing for TCP IP. Uh, the only thing that really happens at layer two uh, is uh, the translation of the logical address, the IP address, to the MAC address going from layer three to layer two. That's that's sort of where TCP IP works out. Yeah, yeah. So this is the map. Again, application transport internet. So we had back here, we called it the DOD model. That's the official DOD, but this is what people refer to it as today. Application transport internet layer. So you'll need to know for sure some, some basic application layer protocols that you've heard before, like HTTP, HTTPS, SMT, SMTP, uh, FTP, TFTP, SNMP, I mean, you'll need to SSH, know Telnet. SSH, yeah, Telnet, yeah. So you and we'll, we'll cover those. We'll cover those protocols in the port numbers because the port number giving going from the network layer to the transport layer, it's either going to be TCP or UDP. Those are the two big ones there, really the only ones you need to worry about. TCP, uh, so if it's going up the protocol stack like port 8, like, say it's uh, web traffic, right? It would go, it would strip off, it would see that it's got a socket there of a, of a source, I'm sorry, destination IP address, colon, uh, port number, right? And that port number is basically who am I handing it up to in the next layer? And then TCP says, oh, this is port 80, I'm handing it up to the HTTP, the application layer. So that's kind of how it flows up. Does that make sense? And it gets packaged down. Uh, combines layers one and two of the OSI model. Uh, yeah, we've talked about this already. Layer one is energy, bits, all that kind of stuff. It's going to depend on the medium, which will be defined at layer two. Uh, yeah, we talked about converting bits, protocol units, Ethernet frames, MAC address, you know, taking that hard, the soft ad, the software or logical address and getting the, the hardware address out of it. Protocols include wide area network, local area network, internet. Those are all network access layer. And even within that, you'll have different protocols that aren't part of the TCP IP model. Like frame relay isn't part of the TCP IP model, but that would be a wide, a wide area network protocol. So 
it sort of gets really fuzzy when you get down into layer two and one for the TCP IP. Uh, the net internet layer. Now, this is a this is a big one. This is actually really, really, really important. This is kind of the brains of the whole operation for TCP/IP. Uh, is the internet layer. This is where IP itself lives. The internet protocol. Uh, it's got a bunch of helper protocols. This is where logical addressing. This is where routing, routing protocols. All those things sort on here. Lines of layer three of the OSI model. IP addresses and routing. If you remember those two things about layer three, you'll be Pretty good. Those are the two biggest functions at, at the network layer. IP version four, IP version six. We're going to cover a little bit about IP version six. I don't think IP version six is ever actually going to be adopted widespread, to be honest with you. Not It's been forever. Uh, we originally they originally came out with IP version six because we were running out of IP address. Uh, then we came up with private IP addressing, network address, address translation. So, and we'll get into what those are, but. Now there's not they're not running out of IP addresses. I mean, Bethel, mm -hmm. the Bethel University still has a whole full Class B routable IP address space. So you I mean, another if, one. If IANA wanted to take some of that back, I mean, seriously, you're not using sixteen thousand. We had another IP one that said, "Oh, we want to do some scanning," and gave us three slash sixteens and like two slash twenty twos, and then so some other stuff on top of it. There's plenty of reclamation left. <laughs> To get those IP addresses back. So that was one reason. Um, and plus, before then, we thought that every every IoT device back then, they'd be just mainly the control systems, SCADA systems maybe, that they would all have to get their own IP address, publicly routable IP address. Well, that's not the case anymore because we put them behind firewalls that do network address translation. We'll, we'll communicate what that is too. Um, so I'm not running out of IP space anymore. And so then you got the security issue, but now there are new technologies that are coming out that are end-to-end -end encryption from the endpoint. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we'll ever get to IP version, to be honest. I think we'll ever need to. We'll go to IP version 8 or 12, something big. ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol. So IP version 4 and IP version 6 uses ICMP too, but for the – for our purposes right now, IP version 4 uses ICMP. That's the control protocol. It, it handles messaging. It handles uh, when I do a ping, that's a, an ICMP echo request. And echo reply, that's the uh, same with traceroute. It's echo request and echo reply, just different TTLs. We'll talk about all that. Not a big deal. But ICMP kind of controls the messaging. It's kind of the traffic cop sort of thing for IP. Uh, and there are other... There are plenty of routing protocols. We'll only cover, I think, what a couple. RIP will come. Mm -hmm. Routing information protocol, OSPF, uh, open shortest path first. The I don't have to do GRP because that's a proprietary Cisco protocol, so that'll be okay. Uh, but we'll talk about the routing protocols too. A lot of things happen at the, at the internet layer. Uh, IP governs, all packets go through IP. Best path destination and packet switching occur at this layer. Any questions on the network layer or internet layer? I call it the network layer, but internet layer is the right way to call it. All right, then the host-to-host -host transport layer. This is where TCP and UDP live. They're, they're the ones that you need to know, TCP and UDP, just two protocols. Now they're they're like, uh, uh, what do you call that uh, when one's like the opposite of the other? Like if I had a twin, no. a doppelganger? Yeah. No. no. That's like evil, right? Well, anyway, they're opposites of each other, Genesis. basically. I don't yeah, and, it yeah. I want to sound something cool, you know, because I just want to be cool. I look better with the cartoon. Did I tell you I rode a <laughs> car? No? I didn't. <laughs> my, wife, my wife wants one now. Oh, jeez. I know. <laughs> We've already talked about it. Uh, all right, sometimes called host to host. Uh, connects the internet layer to the application layer, which is what you'd expect because it's sandwiched in between those two. So ports, whenever you hear port numbers, you're thinking this layer, you're thinking the transport layer. Um, TCP and UDP both have ports. Uh, ports together with the logical addressing that happens at network is called a socket. And we'll talk about that too. Uh, but the port really identifies what application am I going to hand this off to above me. Uh, 
because we all have an application listing, listening on that port, a service, a daemon, will be listening on that port, waiting for traffic, waiting for something to process. So TCP, TCP and UDP, so getting in a little deeper on these, TCP is a connection oriented. <clears throat> it's got more reliability. Uh, it's um, more overhead with TCP, flow control, all those things. It's a connection oriented. If connection oriented, UDP is a connection less protocol. That's where they're completely different. Um, dialogues between source and destination, it'll do things like flow control, sequencing, uh, all that stuff happens with TCP where it doesn't happen with UDP. Packages application information, new segments, provides, and remember those PDs, right? Application, 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 uh, segment, packet, frame, so on, bits. You'll need to, to know those. Uh, reliable full duplex transmission, flow control, windowing, acknowledgements. Windowing is just how much data we're going to negotiate that. If I was communicating with him with TCP, if I was a computer, he was a computer. Part of our negotiation, a three-way handshake would be, hey, how much data do you want to receive in one fell swoop? Or I get an acknowledgement back and send you the next. That's a, that's windowing. Uh, and acknowledgements is based on the same thing. Retransmission, resending anything that's not received within you know some specific time frame. So in TCP, I don't know if we'll get to the three-way handshake today. Yeah, we will. We will. I have to actually have to get going a little faster now. I don't know what. Where's one of my own? Can you see a number? 54. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. UDP. UDP connectionless. TCP connection oriented. UDP connectionless. Best ever. Send it out on the network. It'll get there if it gets there. It'll not if not. Now it's lossy. That means you expect packet loss more with UDP than you do with TCP. The application layer is supposed to compensate for that. So it would fill in the gaps. UDP, um, a lot of times audio streaming, video streaming would be UDP because it's lossy. You don't notice if there's packets missing and the streaming software will just compensate for it. Those are here. Uh, combines layer five through, so this is the application layer. Lots of protocols live here. Think of all the applications you have, all the services that could potentially be running on a computer. Many of those would be, if they're networked, would have a port associated with it, the port meaning uh, it's an application layer protocol. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, SSH. So you need to know what port SSH is. That's TCP 22. You'll have to memorize that. You'll get it later. Telnet, uh, TCP port 23, FTP 21. Um, you'll, just, you'll just memorize those. DNS 53. <coughs> yeah, yeah. UDP first. <laughs> then, yeah, TCP if we don't get a response on UDP. DNS. Yeah. Lots of them. Lots of them. So many protocols. AKA the process layer. Oh, you know what? I wish I had that button. Can we listen to the podcast today? <laughs> How a new button on our mixer. It makes me sound like the devil, man. It's so cool. <laughs> we were laughing so damn hard. It was like <laughs> it was, seven, seven o'clock in the morning and I found this button. I'm like, <laughs> so my voice, you know, I'm looking like this, but then through our headphones, because we both have headphones on over here. It sounds like, yeah, it, sounds like Satan. It does. We started laughing really so hard. Was... And it was our first ever dial-in guest. We had a uh, dial-in guest, Chris, uh, Christophe Foulon from um, Washington, he's out in Washington, D.C. So he dials in. and He I, can't hear that. No, he can't hear it because he can't hear what we hear in the in the actual mix. So, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of talking to him, and I find the button, and I'm like, and we just started laughing. I mean, it was so funny. It was, that wasn't during the podcast. I did do it, though, during the podcast. Just to spice it up. That was super it was, fun. It was, it was fun. I want to talk with that thing, like, always. Like, anytime any salesperson calls me. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it was cool. All right, application layer. So there's some other protocols. High-level protocols, uh, FTP, HTTP, SMTP. Those are TCP examples. UDP examples, boot P. Boot P has uh, sort of been replaced now, kind of with DHCP. Uh, but boot P would be mainly for diskless workstations, network bootable workstations would usually be using boot P. Uh, DNS, we will talk about all this stuff too, some more. TFTP is real file transfer protocol. Uh, connectionless, we would use that a lot. We used to use that a lot for copying off configs from yeah. routers and switches. I don't know what they use it for anymore. Uh, but yeah. Data representation, coding, dialogue control, kind of the 
more sophisticated things happen at this letter. And there. So there's a bunch of stuff there. Which protocols do we have there? All of the protocols. Not all. No. So, so you can see here the network layer, WP, DCP. You know the this is a virtual routing protocol. Um, but you can see the things that play in each one of these. So some of these we can talk about. If we didn't talk, like we'll talk about layer two telling protocol later. We'll talk about point to point telling protocol later. Uh, we'll talk about later the sphere line internet protocol, which is kind of been deprecated. We're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about address resolution protocol, reverse address resolution protocol. We don't have to worry about IR or SARP, but that's okay. MPLS, because we've all heard of MPLS networks, it's a layer two protocol. And we don't have to worry too much about that either. That won't be on the test very much, if at all, really. It's multi multi protocol label switching and it's attaching layer two labels to the traffic flow. Okay. You might we might cover a little bit of uh, MPLS IP, we need to know internet protocol, internet control message protocol. We don't have to worry about these. Maybe a little bit of internet you know, message group protocol. Uh, these are all routing protocols, so BGP or gateway protocol, we will talk about that. That's a, there's two types of routing protocols. There's an interior routing protocol and exterior routing protocols. One's used for interior routing nodes or routing between what we used to call autonomous systems. We still do call them autonomous systems, but it's like two organizations, right? BGP is an exterior routing protocol. RIP, routing information protocol, 15 hot limit. We'll talk. About to delete that one on the test. Don't need to worry about GRP. This is uh, Cisco proprietary routing protocol. Don't need to worry about that. OSPF, we'll talk about. Uh, it's open shortest path first because OSPF and RIP are two different types of routing protocols. So we'll talk about those two. There's TCP and UDP. I believe sort of goes through there. We'll cover a little bit about XF25. A little bit about NetBIOS, and that's it there from the transport layer. Uh, session layer, maybe all that. Likely directory access protocol. We might get a little bit into that. DNS, you just mentioned DNS. Maybe a little bit there. And then up on the top, we'll talk about TACX and TACX Plus. Those are access control protocols for uh, usually for remote access. Right? Remember, we talked about IAAA. Uh, those do those functions for remote access connections. IMAP, maybe. Uh, FTP, FTP, Telnet, SMTP, POP3, HTTP, we have that on top left. We'll need to, we'll need to know all those. Uh, HTTPS, SSH, I say camp, maybe TFTP. But you see, these are all protocols. There's a lot that actually aren't even on here. A lot of protocols that are here. But those are the basics. So when you hear me talking about them, you'll be able to put them in the layers. That, that's why I put this on the slide deck. So if I say, you know, L2TP, you know where that is. It's down here, layer two, or I guess we would call it the data link layer, right? Make sense? So that's a good one. I like this diagram because uh, it's an easy reference. Now, what, one of the things that's not on here, so if you do, if you take this and you print it off, it might be a good idea to go research and find out what port numbers these, these run on, especially when you're talking uh, the higher level protocols like HTTP, DNS. Look up what ports DNS runs on. That lookup will, in writing it down, will reinforce it. Uh, that's a, there's no other way to do this other than memorizing it. Yeah. One of the things that I use to remember this is if you have a protocol that starts with the I, it's going to be network, right? So TCP, UDP are on transport, but ICMP, IP, uh, IPX, those are all network layers. So yeah. if you see a protocol with an I in it, so Easy way to. Yeah. Never mind IMAP. That's not a, it's a <laughs> <Just kidding>. application. <laughs> totally kidding. I know. I'm kidding. I'm Come kidding. on. I did give you, you crap. You did that the last time I put that up too. Did I give you crap too? The last year? Last year, yeah. Last year I did the same thing? Yeah. <laughs> Consistency. Dude, never been known to be consistent. So, encapsulation. So, encapsulation is as it comes down the protocol stack, data gets added to it, right? So, um, you know. IP will want to add its own data. It'll want to add an IP header so that it, the, on the other side, it'll know how to get routed. Uh, TCP will add their own, will add its own header because as it goes down the protocol stack, you need to give information to the lower protocols on what to do with this packet. 
same thing when it gets out on the other side. It's going to strip that data off. So as that data goes down the protocol stack and gets added, stuff gets added, uh, that's called encapsulation. Another good thing about encapsulation uh, is if some another device, if it's not on that same layer, it can't really read. It doesn't understand what that data is. So there is some semblance of security with encapsulation. So it takes information from higher level and adds a header to it. Uh, header meaning at the front of the packet. Uh, one layer, one layer's header is another layer's data. Makes sense. Yeah, all that stuff. Now there it is again. The data segments, packets, frames, and bits are examples of PDUs. So know which PDU goes with which layer. <clears throat> bits layer one, frames layer two, packets layer three, uh, segments TCP and UDP, and then the data itself, the raw data, is what's at the application. Uh, so that's how it goes back up. Uh, reverse is de uh, encapsulation is called multiplexing, or I like the encapsulation better because multiplexing truly is taking, in my mind, is taking multiple data streams and combining them into a single data stream. That's a multiplex. So I don't like the multiplexing, the demultiplexing one, but it's in the book. It's just an example. What happens? So data, data, data. Now we've got segments. Uh, and then we add a header, 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 trailer, sometimes a trailer, not always a trailer. And then the ones and zeros get, or what actually gets transmitted. It gets to the other side, just goes back up and strips it off, strips it off, strips it off. Because in that header, it tells me what to do with it. Where, where does this go above me? So pretty, pretty basic, but if you've never seen it before, it just requires, again, more memorization. And very much functional. I mean, this is what happens on networks. This isn't like the security models where you're like, never going to use it. This is what happens. Uh, other things, uh, TCP IP is a protocol suite. We've talked about that. IP version 4 and IP version 6, they both operate at layer 4 from layer 3. TCP and UDP are layer 4 protocols, layer 5 through 7. We're just drilling this home again. Same stuff that we've already covered. Uh, yeah. Easy. Now, MAC addresses. Now, MAC addresses are hardware addresses. So when you hear MAC, it's hardware. It doesn't mean it can't be overridden in software because it can, uh, but it wasn't always that way. So uh, a logical address, IP, is a logical address. It's an IP address. Uh, it needs to be resolved to a MAC address, a hardware address. It's going to be pulled off the wire uh, and processed by, by another system. So unique hardware address is the Ethernet network interface card. So Ethernet is another protocol standard. It's an IEEE standard. Uh, anything you see, 802s, something with an 802 dot something, that's an IEEE standard. So Ethernet is an 802.3 uh, standard. Uh, burned in at the factory, that's the way it still is, burned in the factory, but used to be you couldn't overwrite it either, which was nice because then when MAC address filtering, when we put MAC address filtering on a switch, we had some belief that it was actually providing some security, but now that you can override that in the software, who cares if you have a MAC address, if you have MAC address filtering? You may have to guess, or you may have to do some protocols. You may have to do some sniffing on that link to find out what MAC address might be cleared through that port, but I don't know. It's almost not even worth it in some cases. Uh, historically, MAC addresses were 48 bits long. The first 24 were assigned uh, to the organization who made the, the hardware. The last 48 or the last 24 bits were burned in, were assigned by. And you can go look at these. There's a link down there at the bottom if you want to see who all the OUIs are. Uh, we sometimes will use this too if we're trying to identify what kind of system is on the network. Never seen this system before. It's generating a bunch of crud and traffic but I want to troubleshoot the first 24 bits would tell me the manufacturer is assuming that it's not been uh, changed right also an attacker though could change it right and mislead us so you know take that with a grain of salt when you're doing a forensic or doing some kind of an incident investigation uh, yeah so any questions on Mac addresses okay if you do an IP config forward slash all on a Windows device or an IF config, you'll see the MAC address. It's that three uh, hex digits and three hex digits. So each one of those digits is eight bits.
bits on byte. Any questions on that? Uh, and now they have a 64 bit because they're running out, as you might imagine. Uh, so two to the, if you want to figure out how many addresses that are, that is two to the 24, so two times two, 24 times, would tell you the entire address space. Uh, 48, so that'd be for the OUI, the organizational unit identifier, and then how much space they have in each uh, pool, I guess. So when you go and look at this, when you go look at the uh, that link at the bottom, you'll see that like Hewlett Packard has a bunch of OUIs because they make a lot of network devices, same with Cisco and so on. So they ran out of space, now they had to make something larger, so they have the 64 bit, that's the extended unique identifier. Uh, that's 2424. I'm sorry, instead of 2424, whatever staff is 64, 32, 32. No, 2440. My bad. Yeah. Sorry. It's right, right there. Reading's, reading's hard for me. I can write, though. I'm an author. You do that. Yes. Yeah. IP version 4, commonly just referred to as IP, 1970s, ARPANET, if you hear ARPANET, that's related to IP version 4. DOD was the first sort of people who made this thing, uh, which then eventually became the protocol for the internet. Al Gore. What's that? Al Gore. Well, Al Gore was, yeah, he was there. He was definitely there. I think he was the chief architect. I mean, he had some help. <laughs> Kidding, right? Al Gore did not create the internet. He did create global warming, though. <laughs> or a solution for it, or something, I don't know. I get confused. There's so much news nowadays. Uh, that probably offended somebody now. Oh, so, uh, I'm going to have to answer those questions. <laughs> Thanks, Evan. So not politically correct. So back on task, uh, one of the people asked, I'll, we'll send it out in the link, but the uh, Sunflower Study Guide hmm. that they updated last year, it's a really great kind of like a, a study guide. No breaks it down. So you'll get a link to download that. Mm -hmm. IP version 4. Uh, so the helper protocol, IP version 4 itself has the ICMP as the helper protocol. We've talked about that already. IP is connectionless, so it does rely on TCP or UDP to provide that flow control and everything else for the connection-oriented piece, TCP, if it needed connection-oriented communication. Uh, so if it, it does require reliability, TCP would 32-bit IP address, so 2 to the 32 is how many potential IP addresses there are in that space. That's it. There's no more. Uh, so 192.168. Now, I'm not going to teach you subnetting. You don't need to know <laughs> subnetting. For, for the, I like subnetting and supernetting, but you don't need to know that for the, for the test. But if you take that into binary, so see that it's four octets, right? An octet meaning eight bits, a byte. So 32 bits, so it's 8888, eight, eight, eight. that's 8 times 4, that's your 32. So each one of those periods is one byte, right? So 2 to the 8th, so you get 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, you have come up with 256. That's the number of possible combinations in each one of those. Now you have to take one off because one is reserved, so or it's basically the top. So it'd be 255, 255, 255, 255, right? That's a broadcast. See what I'm saying? So the 192, now the way the bit positions work, I don't know, I'm geeky, 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1, right? So 192, first bit on, second bit on, the rest of the bits are off, right? 128, 64. So when you look at that in binary, it's 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. 168? 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Exactly. So, but that's how the computer Computers would, that's how that's how computers would work this. So two to the 32 is the total number of uh, IP addresses, 4.3 billion. I probably need for my home network like 4.1, so you guys can have the other point too. Huh? If I was a if I was a post secondary school, I would. Lack of IP version for us was a fundamental problem, but that's since been you know remediated. So two to the 128 is the IP is the address space for it's actually we're gonna I'll show you what the number is here in a minute. So the IP IP header, so that's what gets added on at the network layer. The IP header is 20 bytes long. So we just talked about 
32 bits. This is 20 bytes. A, a bit and a byte. A byte is 8 bits. So this would be 160 bits. Sometimes people get a little confused with that translate. That's okay. You don't need to know that specifically for the exam. What you need to know is that there's an IP header. This is at the network layer. You might need to know that it's 20 bytes long. Key fields within that header are the version itself. This is version 4, version 6, the length of the header so that the receiving computer knows when the next segment begins. Type of service. So T, sometimes you will see it referred to as TOS. Uh, a little bit of quality of service functionality there. Flags are important. Flags help put things back together again. So a flag might be it might be an offset, meaning expect this much data before you look for the next packet that would assemble this next one. So we would do that in fragmentation. Uh, MTUs, maximum transmission units, is how much traffic a network can uh, have per packet, basically. Uh, routers control that. They're the ones that will strip it and send a message back or if it's a do not fragment flag is set on, so that if that flag is set on in the header, the router will just drop the packet and you'll get an ICMP message back saying, hey, whatever, didn't go. Uh, so the, all those things sort of happen inside the header. The header is what tells the receiving router, whatever speaks at layer three, on the other side of the receiving router, what to do with that stuff. TTL is really important. So if something didn't have a time to live, it would just keep bouncing around on the network forever. Uh, routers, each router or hop will decrement the TTL by one, right? So eventually it will just, the TTL will be at zero and the, hop, the router that receives that will just not process and drop the packet. Uh, protocol embedded, this is where we're going of us. Source and destination IP address needs to be known in that header. Then there's some other options and stuff. Uh, that's what it looks like. Now, for, for studying for the test, just look at it, you know, maybe understand where these things find these things in here. Uh, but you don't need to memorize all of what an IP header looks like for the test. Okay, so don't, don't freak out about that. But that's what it looks like. Uh, IP fragmentation. So I talked about mech, I already talked about this a little bit MTUs, the maximum transmission unit, that's how much I'm going to how much the router is going to allow in terms of size of packets on the network. Uh, typical MTUs are 1,500 bytes. Uh, if it exceeds that and the fragmentate, the do not fragmentation flag is turned on. So the flag, see the flags, IP flags right over there, the green. See the green? If that flag is on, the DNF flag, then and it exceeds the MTU, the router is just going to drop it and send an ICMP message back, right? Uh, but that's really rare. Now you play around. So that what attackers will do with all these types of things is fingerprint systems because certain systems, if I send something with weird flags on, you know, off and weird options and weird padding or whatever, I, however I've manipulated my, my packet, uh, certain devices will respond to that differently, right? So a lot of times I can use fingerprinting. You know, I can use that to, to tell, oh, that's a Cisco device, or that's a Palo Alto, or that's a whatever, and then that's intelligence. That's you know, what an attacker do before they launch something. Uh, there's not much you can do against you know, preventing that, but you remember when I said that network layering segmentation? If I've got things set up pretty well, the attacker would have had enough times and make it difficult enough for them to find it that it would raise an alarm. I'd see, what the hell is all this? And map would be a tool uh, if, you, if you want to play around with all kinds of different manipulation of packets. Nmap is a great tool to do that with. It's free. So and if you don't like command line, you can use what Zenmap. Is that the one? The Windows one? Zenmap. Anyway, uh, so all that stuff on IP fragmentation, uh, and that's basically explains what I just said. IP version six is the successor to IP version four. Now I don't know IP version six nearly. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. close to as much as I know IP version four. I know IP version 4 really, really, really well. I know what those packets look like. I can mm -hmm. do all kinds of things with that. IP version 6, next to nothing. So I'm going to be able to tell you about as much as what you can read in the book for IP version 6, to be honest with you. Uh, it's just not something Man. that I use. 
Yeah. And the reality for the exam is, it's you don't need to know more than what's on here anyway. So yeah. nobody, yeah, very few people use it. I think we've only seen maybe three or four. And usually it's research. Oh. Or an ISP. Might be. Uh, larger address space, so a 128 bit address. There's the number down there. Six ten. <clears throat> Lots of address, oops, geez, lots of addresses. Uh, simpler routing, simple address assignment. It's actually got auto negotiation and things. So I turn IP, if I'm not using IP version six on my system, I turn it off. I don't want auto negotiation of anything, just personally. You know, that's a, for me, that's a security hole because I don't know what it's negotiating. Now, you know, at least in an IP version four network, if there's no DHCP, uh, it won't communicate on the network, right? Microsoft tried to fix that with the 169 address address space, which also irritated me. Um, so I don't like auto negotiation. My Microsoft actually says to leave IP version six on, even if you're not using it. I, per, from my, I, I turn it off as a security person. I don't like auto negotiation. I don't like anything that I didn't explicitly permit to communicate. Simple routing, simpler address assignment. You don't need a DHCP server. You can use a DHCP server for IP version six, but you don't need one. It'll auto negotiate by itself. We'll use its MAC address as part of its IP version six address. Uh, lack of IP version, yeah, that was the primary reason. IP version four header is, six header is larger, but it is much simpler. These are the only fields in an IP version six header. Get the version itself, the class of service, which is the same as quality of service. Uh, payload length, yeah, you can see how simple it is. That's an IP version six header. I've got a lot more space though for that source and destination. On the IP version four header, I only have 32 bits that I needed for that here. I've got 128 bits for each. IP version six address is not an auto configuration. This is just, you know, you, chances are you're not using this. So um, we'll just have to read it and, and uh, memorize it. So host can be stateless, can statelessly auto configure a unique address, omitting the need for a static addressing or a DHCP. So stateless auto configuration is not using DHCP. There's also stateful auto negotiation uses DHCP. So I can use DHCP if I want to, but I don't have to. That's the scary part. I, I want to control. Uh, yeah, and you can see the addressing. So where there's zeros in between. So the, the dotted decimal format, like an IP version four, you've got colons, so you've got hex and colons, which is much harder to read if you've never read IP version six before, you don't, you know, are not comfortable with hex, hexadecimal format. Uh, but where there's zeros in between, it just condenses it and puts as, uh, those colons. So you can see there's an address there, scope global, scope link. So a scope link won't route globally. Uh, it'll get stopped and dropped at a router that speaks IP version six. Uh, but anyway, not gonna spend a lot of that. CIDR format, we're gonna talk about CIDR here in a little bit. That's class of center domain routing. We're gonna get to that. It's This is all you need to know for IP version six. It's not gonna spend a lot of time on it because I don't think I'll provide any value to your reading in IP version six anyway. Just now my thing. So some security challenges, automatically configuring. I don't like that. That's, the number one, um, yeah, sometimes I, ISPs are enabling IP version six without knowledge. I don't think that happens nearly as much as maybe the book would lead us on to believe. Uh, yeah, if you're not using it, I disable it. All right, so I back to IP version four. Again, the original IP version four were class full. That's up until 1994, which means networks, uh, network spaces were uh, they didn't change. I couldn't manipulate them. I couldn't, if, uh, if I had a class B, uh, which is, you know, two to the 16. Yeah. Uh, so two times two times two, which it ends up being what? 16,184. So if I had class B, if that was what was assigned to me, I couldn't segment that. I couldn't make that into smaller chunks. So if I only have 14 hosts that need to communicate on a class B, I'm stuck with that big ass, excuse me, big address space. I don't need that big address space. So it's a, it's a complete waste of, it's a, it's a waste. But that's the way it was. <coughs> there are four classes, five classes, class A through E, 
A, B, and C are really the only ones that you ever use. Uh, class D, you know, multicast, and class E would be just experimental uh, or reserved. Uh, so class A through C, so you can see the bit, so the leading bits. So if you go back to, like I was saying, uh, 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. So the leading bit on a class A has to be a zero. It means the 128 bit is off. That only leaves 127 left over, right? Actually, 128 gets a little funky now. Uh, so that's it. Um, and that's that would be for the uh, network address. So you've got things called network addresses and host addresses. So a network address, the first in a class A, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, the rest would be reserved for the hosts. So the first bit is reserved for networks. The rest is reserved for hosts. Does that make sense? So 2 to the 31, that's a large number of hosts that are left over. Uh, so number of networks, 128 networks. Yeah, start address, ending is. So when all the bits are turned on, uh, that's a 255. That would be a broadcast. Um, used to be we couldn't use network addresses or broadcast addresses. Now you can address things with the network address itself. Uh, but that's good to remember. So I was really strict, you know, which then made it really wasteful. So we're running out of IP addresses. So we needed to do something a little bit better. Uh, so we came up with classless interdomain routing. So that means that instead of me being stuck with classical boundaries, say I only, you know, on a class uh, let's do, we keep it simple, a class C network. A class C network, going back here, gives me 255 potential hosts, right? Because the first three bits are essentially taken for the networks. Uh, so that would give me 255 potential hosts, but I've only got 10 hosts that I need, right? With a CIDR network, a class of center domain routing network, I'd only need the one, the four, one, two, four, eight. Right? That would give me 12, 15, 15 addresses. So then instead of having uh, a subnet mask or using, this is getting crazy now. I am teaching you. You're, you're going to go. I'm sorry. Forget it. Just memorize this. I'm getting crazy now. I'm getting into subnetting. And we don't, you don't need to know subnetting for the, for the exam. Uh, but what, one of the things, it, I guess what I'm getting at is I didn't have to be wasteful anymore in my network boundaries, right? If I had a, if I had a class B assigned to me, I could segment that into multiple smaller networks and get much more uh, granular in my routing, much more in control of my network, as opposed to just having one big, flat, fat class B. Does that make sense? Because performance on a class B network that large would be terrible. Anyway, so you, you want to segment it up. Class of center domain routing allows me to do that. And this is just an explanation. So when you see a slash something, so 192.168, or we got there, 192.020 slash 24, that slash 24 means the first 24 bits are assigned to the network. That leaves me eight bits, right? 32 minus 24, eight bits for host. Does that make sense? So if I see a slash 24, how many hosts could I fit on that? Two to the eight minus one because one's going to be a broadcast. That give me two fifty five, right? And that's essentially how it all works. So that slash whatever is how many how many bits are reserved for the network mask or the network address space? Cider allows me to do that. that that's how we would say it. Cider sounds cooler. We get a lot more friends when you sound cool. And cartoons, I think. Yeah. <coughs> Bless you. Uh, RFC 1918, you'll need to remember RFC 1918 because this is where INA separated out private IP address spaces versus publicly routable IP address spaces. This then allowed me to have non-routable, meaning they can't route on the public internet. They can route fine internal, but they wouldn't go across a router onto the internet um, that's RFC 1918 that allowed me. So these are network spaces, network address spaces that are reserved for public ad or private addressing. So you see the 10, 
that 0, that 0, that 0 slash 8. So if you're, you know, troubleshooting a network and you can't figure out why, you know, your 10.1.7.53 packet isn't going across the router, it's because it, it's not supposed to, meaning out to the Internet, because it's not routable, right? That would stay in your internal network. 172.16 slash 12, and then 192.168.0 slash 16. So if you go home, check your home network, it's a 192.168 something, because it's a private IP address space. Does that make sense? RFC 18. RFCs are re requests for comments. They're public documents that you can go and read all of them if you want to. But you'll need to remember RFC 1918 and that that is a private IP address space. Yeah, I yeah, know which, which ones those are. Yeah, and you'll need yeah. to memorize that middle part there, what IP address spaces are uh, RFC 1918. Uh, network address translation. So if I'm going to translate, so I have a private IP address space here, but I need to communicate on the Internet, there needs to be a translation that takes place right on the gateway. Uh, usually your firewall would do this translation. Uh, so it would translate your private IP address space to a public IP address space, and then you could communicate, and then it would translate it back when those packets come back to you. There's three types that you'll need to know. One is static net. That's a one-to-one -one mapping. So if I have 200 systems that need to communicate on the Internet, uh, I would need 200 public IP addresses in that pool or in that mapping on the, on the router. That's the most wasteful kind, and you don't see it. Often you might see it on a one or one or two here and there. Uh, the next is pool net. That's called dynamic net. Net meaning network address translation. Uh, that would be a pool of IP addresses. Uh, so I might have 20 IP addresses for 200 systems. Right? That just means 20 only 20 systems will be able to communicate at the on the internet at any one given time. Right. So we just pool and assign them, and reclaim them as it goes. The most common is port address translation. Now, the way port address translation works is it's a many, many potentially to one IP address. So I have one public IP address that's assigned, and the way that the gateway keeps track of that is source and destination ports. So when my, my computer wants to communicate with something, it'll take a what's called an official port, a high port number, uh, anything over 1024, but usually somewhere in the 50 to 60,000 range. The total number of ports that you can use is also 32 bits, so 65, 535. Um, and my computer will choose a random port as a source port. So when I send a packet to the Internet, I'm going to have my source IP address, my source port, that's going to be my socket, who I want to communicate with, destination IP address, destination port, the destination IP address and destination port won't be probably unique. But what the on a port address translation, the gateway would maintain a table of this source port, this this source port, uh, this source IP, this source port. I gave this IP address and this new source port. Right. So that's how I can use multiple IP one IP address to service multiple clients on the inside. Does that make sense? That support address translation. That's why it's that's the most common and that's the most efficient way to do it. But you'll need to know for the test the difference between static, uh, pool, and port address translation. That's a diagram to communicate it. I'm gonna go a little faster now. ARP and RARP address resolution protocol and reverse address resolution protocol. So if I've got a logical IP address, it needs to be resolved to a physical address. That's an ARP. Going the other way around, that's a RARP. Reverse address resolution protocol. Uh, what, this is broadcast traffic. Um, so, what basically what happens is I need to communicate with 192.168.0.1. So I'll broadcast, hey, who's got 192.168.0.1? 192.168.0.1 says, I've got it. Here's my MAC address. Okay, thanks. And then you'll start the communication. Where that can, can get kind of hairy is called an ARP poisoning attack. So the gateway says, yeah, I've got that IP address. Here's my MAC. But if I'm an attacker and I say, hey, I've got that IP address. Here's my MAC. Now you're going to be communicating with me, potentially, or both of us. right? And that's a very simple attack. There's ways to stop it, but that's common. RARP is, disk, like I said before, diskless workstations. Uh, I'm booting up. I know my MAC address. I don't know my IP address. So I'll broadcast my MAC address, say, hey, who's got an IP address for me? 
the RARP server, or server that's configured for this, will say, hey, IP address, and we'll be able to start communication. That's essentially how that works. Different types of broadcast traffic, unicast, multicast, and broadcast. Pretty simple, unicast one to one, multicast one to many, broadcast one to all. Limited and directed broadcast. So this is broadcast that may or may not be able to span across a router because routers by default won't forward broadcast traffic. They'll limit that, they'll keep it to the local network. Uh, but a broadcast will be sent to all traffics on the local area network. There are ways that you can try to get a broadcast across a router that would be a directed broadcast. One of the ways this this used to be done way back when it's not effective anymore would have been the uh, Smurf attack. You guys ever heard of a Smurf attack? A Smurf attack would be an amplified. Uh, so what I would do is I'd spoof, like if I wanted to attack him, I would spoof my source address to be his address, I'd send a broadcast traffic to a large network. The large network would then respond to him because I think it came from him, not from me. Right? That would potentially, back in the day, that would take him offline sometimes. Right, that's a Smurf attack. There's also called, and you can probably see it on the exam. I don't know why they could still cover it because it's not it, it's not functional anymore. Um, another attack uh, that's very similar to that is called the Fraggle attack, which uses the same concept but uses a UDP packet instead of an ICM packet. So that, those will probably be on the exam. Uh, but anyway, a limited broadcast is just, hey, all bits are on. That doesn't go across a router. Uh, that's how that works. A, a directed broadcast would say, hey, I want to actually do a broadcast of three hops down. That would be addressed that way with that last octet then or whatever the network address is. Uh, yeah, makes sense. There are two broadcasts. So broadcast domains, broadcast domains and uh, what's the other one I'm thinking of? There's two. Forget it. Brain's not working. There's another word I had. Uh, the broadcast, all nodes in the broadcast domain. So that would be a MAC address. Uh, so all bits are turned on to, F, you know, all on. So in hex, it's FF. Um, Ethernet switch. So if a switch is, a switch will fill this too because it's not going to send it out all ports. Probably. Maybe it will. Uh, uh, but it would be, you know, I want to communicate with everything regardless of what your MAC address is. So your, so your system is waiting, is listening to everything that's going on on the, on the network, and it'll process up to the MAC address, right? So you'll see MAC address broadcasts if you plug in a sniffer. Uh, you'll see those all over the place. Your computer is only going to pick up and process the one, its MAC address, right? Uh, so this would just be sending it out to everybody. Everybody would see it. Promiscuous mode, <laughs> naughty computer. Just kidding. I mean, right? It is what it says. It is a naughty computer. <laughs> Security people don't like. I don't mm -hmm. like anything because they're very difficult to detect. Um, if there's a computer running on the network that's in promiscuous mode, which means it's Mac, it's system network interface card, its drivers are set to basically process everything that it sees on the network, regardless of whose MAC address it is. So it'll process everything. Sniffers use promiscuous mode. IPS devices use promiscuous mode. ID, IDS devices use promiscuous mode. Um, they're very difficult to detect. The only way you can really detect them is through voltage, right? And not most of us don't have fluke detectors you know, or fluke devices on our networks uh, monitoring voltage variations on links. Most of us don't even monitor network traffic on links, let alone, you know, but otherwise they're very difficult to find. Mm -hmm. You don't know who's actually, uh, there are other mitigating controls, but we don't like promiscuous mode unless it's authorized. So the way you would connect this up to, because I'm only going to see if I'm connected to a switch, the only thing I'm going to see is what's forwarded out that port on the switch. So the switch is still filtering traffic. I'm only going to see what's really destined because it's remember the switch maintains a MAC address table. So the only thing I'm going to see coming down that switch port is going to be broadcast traffic, all Fs, or stuff that's specifically for me, right? So if I wanted to see traffic that was going to him, I wouldn't see that if I, had, if I was running in promiscuous mode. The way I would get around that is I'd either use a hub, connect both of our ports to that hub to the switch potentially, 
that way I'd see it all, all of our traffic, or uh, a span port or a tap port. And a span port and tap ports basically are just replicating traffic out uh, a number of ports on the switch to a specific span port. Make sense? We do this for trouble. There are authorized real reasons to be using this, but if you're not authorized, this, this will get you fired in some places. All right, there's TCP, reliable layer four. Here we are again. You see up on the application layer, Telnet, FTP, SMTP, DNS, uh, was it RIP and SNMP? Uh, you'll need to know those protocol port numbers, which I think I provide you later, but 23, 21, 25, 53. Um, I've never seen, um, is that right? RIP shouldn't, no, yeah, it is. Yeah. I don't know, RIP is 59, 59. DNS is if you You don't need to know RIP. SNMP is 61. Yeah, uh, IPsec. So you see where all the protocols sort of play together again. Uh, TCP header 20 bytes long, important fields, source and destination port. Now those play, right? Network address, source and destination port, uh, That that's called a socket when you have those pairs. So IP address port, IP address port, those are sockets. So sequence and acknowledgement numbers, full duplex communication, TCP flags. This is where you get all kinds of funky in your port scanning. You guys ever done port scanning before? Um, you get all kinds of different, uh, not as much as you used to, but um, you could really fingerprint systems really well by setting different flag combinations in your TCP headers. Uh, this is what it looks like. So there's our system port, sequence number, acknowledgement number. You can see all the flags and what the flags are. If you light them all up, what's that called? Christmas tree, yeah, exactly. They used to crash some systems. They do fragment offsets overlapped. Not anymore. They're old now. Uh, but the flags are, I think, that are the most important. Um, you got SIN, SIN, AC, or SIN, AC, uh, urgent. Uh, those are probably the ones that you need to know the most, probably. Yeah. Uh, TCP ports, uh, yeah. So there, this is the same thing I told you about before. Destination ports, 51178 would be an ephemeral port. It's above. IANA has ports that are assigned for specific applications, 1024 and below. Anything above 1024 and IANA, IANA, that's the Internet Assigned Numbering Authority. They may have assigned ports above the 1024, but it's a lot less likely that you can't reuse it. So those are ephemeral ports is what they're called. So 51, 178 is an ephemeral port going to port 22 to be SH. Uh, 16 bits. Yeah, there you go. Two types of ports, reserved and ephemeral. Jeez. And IANA. There's IANA too. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, socket. So I've mentioned sockets before. So you see that the sockets are, this is just a net stat, simple net stat. Open up a command prompt, type in net stat. That's one of the first things we do in a lot of forensic investigations too, right? See what network connections are in place. That's more live forensics, which we'll talk about in like a few future classes. Um, but you can see source port or source, source port, destination, destination. So you can look at this and see those ephemeral ports for the source ports. You can see where some of those are going. Uh, 443, that's HTTPS. Uh, 135, that's, um, oh God. That BIOS, uh, for, for, yeah. So you can see the communications that are taking place in that. TCP flags. We've talked about. There you go. Urgent acknowledgement, push, reset, sin, and fin. Fin means basically we're done with communication. That's a graceful disconnect. Uh, but resets are kind of angry. Uh, you'll see a way handshake. Do we get into that? Yeah. Sin, synac, and act back. So. The way a three-way handshake is, so we have to agree on things in a TCP connection because it's a connection-oriented protocol. So whoever I'm communicating with, we have to agree on window size or windowing. We have to agree on flow control, acknowledgements, all those things. The way that happens is I first will send a SYN packet. That's a request to synchronize. When the receiver receives it and they want to communicate, they'll send a SYNAC back, meaning acknowledge, and here's my parameters. And then you'll have an act back, the acknowledgement back, and that'll be the three-way handshake, and then you'll be able to start communicating. So all TCP uh, connections have the SYN, SYNAC, 
Sin, sin, act, and act back. That's, that's the sequence. Sin, sin, act, and act back. Once that has been acknowledged, then normal communications take place. Um, an attacker can use this information as well. We do different types of, I talked about setting different flags on, um, on port scanning, uh, different, come on, where'd it go? Different systems will react differently to different, where'd my mouse go? Did it die? Nope. Nothing I do dies. All right, well, I got this other thing called a key pad, uh, touch pad. All right, there's a three way handshake. Send us an act and act back, and then communication begins. UDP, much simpler. There is no sin, sin, act, and act back. There's no connection oriented. Totally connection list. You'll need to remember that. Send and pray, those that you see there. Source destination, uh, protocol, UDP link, source port, destination port, link, checksum. So length is about the only thing you're going to get in terms of you know, any reliability. The receiving system would know that it was supposed to. And the checksum, I guess, works too, because if there's corruption in the packet, it would calculate out to a different checksum. Do you remember checksums? Uh, uh, hashing algorithms, typically, we use for problems. ICMP Internet Control Message Protocol is the helper protocol. Helps layer three, uh, all kinds of things with ICMP. The most commonly would be ping, echo request, and echo reply. That's what an, I, that's what an ICMP packet header looks like. Type, code, and you can see in there the different types of packets, whether it's an echo request, echo source quench, what, whatever type of packet this is. Uh, yeah, for sonar, it's cute. Whatever, echo and echo reply. Uh, Traceroute is interesting. So Traceroute also uses ICMP echo reply, echo and ICMP reply packets. The thing it does is search the with a, a TTL of zero. So first I'll send a packet with a TTL of zero. The router will get it, reply back, hey, you know, your packet didn't go anywhere. Then my computer will say, all right, now I'll set it to a TTL of one. Now I'll go through that first router, go to the second router, because every router decrements the TTL by one, right? So we go to that second hop and then reply back, hey, can we get there? And then you go on to the third, right? Because I would increment my TTL now to two. Through the first hop, to the second hop, now it times out on the third hop. But that's how it goes, right? Uh, trace route packets are just ICMP echo and reply with different TTLs. That's what that looks like. Uh, what else we have? Application layer, yeah, presentation, session, trans application. I'll try to get through this fairly quickly. Any questions so far? Pretty straightforward. Okay. So Telnet TCP port 23. We don't like Telnet, you know, because Telnet's clear text. There's no encryption. Uh, so usernames and passwords are sent in clear text, as are everything else that happens in the session. Uh, but tel Telnet's a terminal emulation over the network is what Telnet's for. Uh, Telnet server listens on TCP port 23. Secure shell is an encrypted method. Uh, it's actually sweet, kind of a suite of protocol, but uh, secure shell is TCP port 22. FTP is file transfer protocol. This is also clear text, so we don't necessarily like FTP either, unless we're sending just nothing. It's an anonymous FTP server where I'm just storing public type data. Um, TCP port 21. Uh, you used to. We used to have two ports, but not anymore. Uh, so we'd use one for a control connection. It actually be two connections, one for the data transfer and one for the control. Now everything is uh, TCP port 21. TFTP, UDP, port 69, so notice this connection less. Uh, it's dumping lossy data that you don't really care all that much about. Bootstrapping, we would used to use this for uh, copying things off into a TFTP server for later restore if we needed it. SolarWinds. Huh? SolarWinds TFTP. Yeah, SolarWinds TFTP, yeah. Uh, no confidentiality, no integrity, just get it out there. SSH, SSH is a replacement for, and actually SSH can be used for Telnet, it can use, be used for file transfer. Um, so SFTP, SSH, uh, 
th those are the same, basically, from the same protocol, TCP port 22, same daemon. Secure copy, same thing. Uh, so if you're secure copy, SFTP, SSH, essentially the same protocol, just used for different purposes. But it's encrypted, which we like. Um, yeah. Good enough. SMTP pop and IMAP, these are all mail. SMTP is port 25. Uh, the thing about SMTP is it's store and forward, so it, if, it, if, if a mail server can't get it to another mail server, it'll store it for a while and then try it again until it times out, and then it'll go back, typically, unless there's some address problem. Uh, POP is used just like it, it. That's actually a really good name for it because it just pops mail off the server. There's no mail storage in POP, post office protocol, uh, and IMAP. Internet Message Access Protocol. Those are the ports they use, 110 and 143. Uh, just used for mail. DNS. DNS uses two different protocols. It uses UDP first. Uh, uses TDP for zone transfers. It also uses TCP if UDP fail. So if there's no response back from a DNS server on UDP, it'll try TCP. Uh, but DNS is one of those kind of different sort of protocols where it'll use both UDP or TCP. Uh, or both. DNS also has this, there's different types of DNS servers, there's different types of queries, uh, recursive queries, um, authoritative name servers. Don't uh, Recursive query be, I don't own this domain, so like the frsecure.com, there's an authoritative name server for frsecure for that domain. If somebody from like, uh, I don't know, XYZ company, they have their own domain server. That's their one that they're set up for. Um, they'll query their xyz.com domain server. Hey, where's FR, give me frsecure.com's IP address. It'll do a recursive query up to the .com and then back to the frsecure, and then it'll cache it at uh, xyz.com. Does that make sense? That's a recursive query. There's, it's not an authoritative name server. An authoritative resolution would be one that I, I actually own that startup authority, that SOA record. The utility you use to kind of go through DNS stuff is NS. You know, it's a great tool to get used to. Caching servers will cache temporarily. Um, and that's one of the problems with DNS actually is corrupting the cache. Attackers can corrupt potentially the cache uh, and then get people involved to IP addresses that aren't legit. This is how DNS works. You can see the recursive queries, authoritative queries, caching. Um, it's a tree structure, DNS is. So you've got the dot is actually the top of the domain, up top of the entire tree structure. That's the root. Um, and then you've got com, edu, org. I mean, there's like a billion of them now. It used to be real simple when you had com, edu, org, and net. Yeah. Now, dot yeah. porn, dot dumb, dot dog and there's just so many of them now and then the next level domains are um, just common domains that you would register with the, the top level domain authority or registrar uh, DNS weaknesses it's unreliable UDP um, name servers there's really not authentication built into UDP so um, it is possible to get in in uh, at man in the middle potentially in corrupt cache caching name servers with bogus records uh, the protection against that is dnssec which then integrates public key cryptography with um, dns so uh, there's authentication now built in between the dns servers uh, there's still no encryption built into udp but at least the name servers that are exchanging uh, record, you know, name records are authenticated with the encryption. So DNSSEC has actually been around for quite a while. It's sort of frustrating that people still aren't using it um, because it is it's very effective. It's not too difficult to set up either. So it's uh, really to protect against those cache poisoning attacks. Uh, and this is just some recent news. This isn't necessarily testable, but ICANN is starting to run out of patience because there are legitimate state-sponsored attacks against DNS. Uh, and they, they, they've been getting away with it because nobody's putting in DNSSEC. So I can release like, seriously, do it. I'm getting mad now. 
but they don't have any. I mean, even though they're, they're numbering, they, really they can't do anything about it because there is no governing. But still, something's going to happen. Uh, HTTP and HTTPS, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, port 80, HTTPS, which would be leveraging SSL or TLS. HTTPS is not SSL or TLS. That's separate, right? It's a, it's, it's a protocol that runs in the application. So SSL and TLS are different uh, than HTTPS. But 40, 443 and 80, DHCP is very, very similar. Boot P has kind of been deprecated now for DHCP in most parts. Boot P would essentially just give you an IP address and very limited uh, stuff about you on the network. DHCP has all kinds of options that I can set. I can set DNS servers. I can set you know default gateways. Well, I can do that with Boot P too, but uh, DNS servers, uh, proxies, all kinds of different things with DHCP that I can't do with Boot P. Both run on UDP uh, 67, and they won't be forwarded by routers unless I specifically enable that traffic. So it means I'd have to have a Boot P or a DHCP server on each network segment, each layer three network segment, or forward that traffic across the router manually. They have to configure that. By default, that wouldn't go. All right, layer one network cabling. Gosh, how did I still extend this? It's because I'm talking about some Network stuff. Oh, man. All right, network cabling. Bad things with network cabling, EMI, electromagnetic interference. That'd be like I told you that one story with my, uh, yeah, don't run them over fluorescent lights unless you got the right shielding for it. Uh, now, but the thing about EMI, though, is fiber optic is not susceptible to EMI. There's no electromagnetic interference with fiber optic. So if I am running over fluorescent lights, fiber optic would work just fine. It's just fiber optic is just blinks of light. Crosstalk is when I have you know two cables that are too close together and they're not shielded well enough. It's possible for one signal to cross over to another. You've ever been on the phone? Well, you guys, nobody does this anymore. Oh, like old, older folks, when you get on the phone, you'd hear another conversation happening at the same time. That would be crosstalk. Like, what? Hello? They're having this conversation. You're hearing everything that they're saying. Uh, the same thing happens on network cabling, and attenuation is that weakening of the signal over over a halt, over a, a distance. Unshielded twisted pair, that's what it looks like. The tighter the twist, the better the resistance to EMI. So that's why you do the twisting. Uh, uses pairs of twisted. Anybody ever made cables before? Crimp thrown cables? That's a fun exercise. Uh, if you haven't, don't feel like you missed anything. Unshielded twisted pair. Cables are classified by categories according to their rated and speed, tighter twisting, more dampening. Uh, these are some cable categories. You'll need to memorize these, uh, certainly five and seven. Probably Cat 3, too. Cat 3 would have been the old, uh, the older uh, phone signal, phone analog lines. Uh, you can see token ring is up there. Nobody uses token ring anymore. Whopping uh, 16 megabits per second. Uh, these are UTP categories with copper cable. So all these are twisted pair. Now, um, the applications are good uh, in the category. So you'll need to know the categories on this one more than anything else, just the categories and kind of what they're used for. There's another one coming up, too, where I'll get into the different standards, the IEEE standards. You'll need to memorize that one, too. Uh, coax cable, that's what coax cable looks like. Copper wire, insulation, mesh, and insulation on the outside. Uh, probably all CMEs, thin net, thick net. These were, this was the original Ethernet specification. The original IEEE 802.3 specification used coax cable. Uh, resistant to EMI and longer distance. There's a vampire tap there, and there's a BNC connector if you've ever been around those. The vampire tap on the left, right, it crunches down actually puts two prods into the actual copper in the wire, and that's how you would communicate. And then you can see the wire coming off. That would then go to the computer or the terminal, whatever's communicating. Uh, well, that's a, see the bouncing? That's a train or earthquake. <laughs> BNC T connector and then the cable connector that just brings back memories. Uh, fiber optic cable. So you can see now, theoretically, fiber optic cable has unlimited because you can split it into unlimited number of frequencies, right, with a prism. See, there's one frequency coming in, but then you split it into 
however many colors there are in a in a rainbow, which is theoretically infinite. Uh, so that's that's the among many other things, that's the real appeal of fiber optic. Fiber optic used to be glass. Now it's plastic. So the glass ones were very brittle and you break them and splicing these was a pain in the butt. That also makes us a lot more secure too because um, with like copper cables, um, I can tap into copper cables without being detected. Oftentimes you can't really do that with fiber optic. There's going to be a time when you're going to have to split that light and insert something into it. I mean, it might be a flash of a second, but it'll it's harder. Uh, so uses light to carry information uh, yeah, past 50 miles. No AMI, no electromagnetic interference, no crosstalk with um, fiber optic cables. Disadvantages, cost, complexity, not so much anymore. Used to be, uh, certainly when they were glass. Do you remember seeing glass fiber optic cable? It was actually made out of glass. You never saw? Mm -hmm. no. You can break it. You, you know, you've seen those... Uh, those uh, things that make lights? Yeah. Yeah. You make them. They wouldn't light, but you can break them. Multi-mode uh, fiber carrier and single-mode fiber carrier. Just one. It's uh, one, one, one signal or two, essentially. Uh, multiple paths, light, light dispersion, single-mode, whatever. Uh, Wavelength division multiplexing, that's the true multiplexing of splitting out and then reconstituting on the other side. Uh, MDM, WDM is used for that. So there's DWDM, uh, just essentially the same thing I just talked about in diagrams. Technology and protocols, holy buckets. Uh, yeah, Ethernet is still, it is the most common. Um, it's, it's what you'll see everywhere. Network is transferred in, in data and frames. It's a typical bus topology. Oftentimes, it's a logical star. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the original Ethernet was just a physical bus. So one line, everybody connected to that line. You sever the line, you sever the network. So it wasn't resilient. Uh, layer one issues, physical medium, layer two, and frames, those are both in the Ethernet specification baseband. Here's the other one that I was talking about. Uh, the types of Ethernet, a little bit harder to read, but you can see that like 10 base, whatever. The 10 is how fast. Base is baseband. Uh, and then that usually the cabling type is the last portion of those. So, you know, speed, baseband, broadband, all Ethernet's baseband, so they'll all be base something. Um, the, most, the most common ones um, on this line, let me see, just real quick. I can't read it from here. 100 base TX, 1000 base TX, 1000 base T, this is short, LX. This is the most common, like, this small thing with fiber running at 10 gigabits per second. It's, it, it's out there, it's just not going to be on the test. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? All right, Ethernet, uh, two types of Ethernet. Uh, carrier sense, car Ethernet itself is called carrier sense multiple access. So it's going to sense that there's no network data for some period of time, and then it's going to go ahead and transmit. There are two types. Well, there's still two types. There's collision detection, cl collision detection and collision avoidance. Collision avoidance would wait a longer period of time and, and be like sort of extra sure that it wasn't, collision avoidance is much slower than collision detection. Uh, Apple Talk collision avoidance, uh, 802.11, which is a wireless standard, is collision avoidance. All Ethernet today is collision detect. Uh, so up here, carry sense multiple access, and then there's the steps that it goes through. Fairly simple. Um, it's foreign. It's just another memorization thing. ARCnet, dead. Nobody's using ARCnet anymore, but it used to be sort of cool. Token ring, you had, uh, token ring would mean my computer had to pass the token in order to communicate on the network. So there were no collisions in token ring networks. Um, token would go around the network, right? It was a logical ring, physical star. So you'd connect into, like a traditional token ring network would connect into what's called a multi-station this year. Um, so it'd go in one port, out the next, in one port, out the next. That's what created the logical ring. 
even though it was a physical star network. So position of the token allowed you to send. No collision, it was very predictable. 2.5 megabits per second, super, super duper fast. Uh, the last vision, <laughs> version of token ring was 16 megabits per second. Uh, same thing. Yeah, 16 megabits per second. And we were actually really happy about that. Fiber distributed data interface, so we we, we also call this FIDI. If you ever, I mean, not, not FIDI like FIDI sense. We used to actually call this FIDI before there was a FIDI sense. Uh, logical ring, primary and secondary happened. It was meant to be for redundancy. The primary ring and then the redundant secondary ring. What most of us did, though, rather than using the redundancy, we just activated both rings. We get put twice the speed. So that's what you ended up doing with FIDI. Uh, single FIDI ring rings that run 100 megabits per second, so we'd get a whopping 200 megabits per second if we use the secondary ring and just lose the redundancy. Bus topology, that's what a bus topology looks like. Everybody's just connected in a string, break the string. The tree topology, uh, a hierarchical network. This is what a tree topology looks like. This would be a polling type of network typically. So you'd have a central mainframe type it's a, it's a system that would control the network communication. These other systems might pull it, right? I want to talk to you, can I talk? I want to talk to you, can I talk? That's typically what this type of architecture does, uh, but there's other ways to run it too. Uh, there's the ring network, and this was always a logical ring physical star, right? That MAU is the multi-access unit, and MSAU, they're the same thing, multi-station access unit. It's just a big switch, basically. Basically, but it, it goes in and out, in and out, in and out, which makes that ring. Star topology, uh, this is the one that most of us use, right? You have a, a switch, and everybody connects into the switch, it's just a star. Um, first popularized ArcNet, um, that's the simplest way. Obviously, we have multiple uh, nowadays. We've got uh, switches connected to switches, trunk ports, and all this other stuff. But for the test, this is what you need to know, star. Uh, then I gave you some kind of uh, warning because I felt like it or something. So there you go. You've been warned. What did I warn them about? Oh, logical and physical. Yeah, you'll just need to be able to get your head around them. the logical and physical construct, primarily around the ring network. We got mesh and partial mesh. So mesh network is, you know, if you've only got three or four nodes that need to communicate with each other, a full mesh network is fine. But you get out to 50 nodes, and every node has to to every other node in a full mesh network. It, it's not feasible, so it doesn't scale a full mesh. Instead, uh, you might do a partial mesh. So certain central systems might have multiple connections to other central systems. You would do this for high availability. This was a really resilient network. It has to just it has to be running no matter what. In real world, we don't do this really much. We might have on certain critical servers, you might have sort of a partial mesh where you have two network you know, interface cards, one going to one switch, one going to another. You might see that occasionally, but in terms of the full network being meshed, it's hard to do. It's expensive. Holy oh, crap, I finished only 22 minutes late because I'm really slow and I'm not a good team. But you've seen me in a uh, cartoon, and I drove a thing. Range Rover. Range Rover. Yeah. And Harley. I, I, yeah, I like Harleys. My wife won't let me get another one. Uh, did you hear what happened to me in my Harley? My last one? I hit a deer. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, it's like right it was, before I started. Yeah, it was a doe. Oh, yeah. She was pregnant with twins. Oh, I did that one. I was coming and uh, saw her over here, you know, as I was coming up over a ridge. I was like, you better not. Don't, and sure enough, me, bam, bent my front forks in my front tire, hit the frame, and at that point, there's no control going over. Because you're supposed to hit them. Like, if I'm going to hit them, I'm hitting them dead on. So you don't swerve, so that'll get worse. Yeah, I slid maybe, I don't know, 150, 200 feet probably. My bike, another 50 feet past me, just a blood trail. And I'm just full of uh, deer crap like all her innards are like on me i got a picture of it and so i was wrapped up like a mummy for like i don't know months because you know you had so much road rash no broken bones though i wasn't wearing a helmet 
Oh, jeez. Uh, uh, one more and a half. One of my boots fell off. I, you know, I had the biker boots. Like, enough to get them off, untie them. One of those had flown off. Yeah, it was crazy. So I'm not allowed to ride anymore. My wife won't let me. All right. So uh, please try to catch up in your reading. Uh, that's not Thursday. Who put that? We'll learn, Brandon. I'm pretty sure I had that right because I remember writing this part yesterday. Well, anyway. You have till Wednesday. Uh, we left off at page 253. Uh, Wednesday, we'll finish up the chapter in domain. So we'll get through this technical part and get into, uh, I don't know what comes after that, probably uh, software development, maybe. That's it. So thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. I seriously got to go in my mouse. What if it's because I got all this?